a warm welcome also from our side. We live in quite exciting times. Times of change, which also brings some challenges, uh, challenges to us. New technologies and innovations are confronting us day by day. Our daily life is changing, especially because of the corona situation, where we have to define words like digitalization or connectivity in a new way. We interact differently with each other, with our families, parents, grandparents, friends. And of course, all this change and this whole situation has also consequences for our economy. Our companies are rethinking their business models, thinking about new business processes. And what is, for us, especially interesting, is a new focus on intralogistics needs. This is why we received in the last weeks many requests of you as, a, as our customers concerning restructuring of warehouses. The wish is to be more flexible, more independent from labor, and also to have a, a more smarter steering of the warehouses house in the future. Ah. So the fact that people start rethinking their warehouses is, of course, to me, music in the ears. Uh, it proves that the... Um, Industry 4.0, that the digitalization in form of uh, automated warehouses, that it's not just a hype, yeah? that it's not a bubble, uh, that it's not even, let's say, the future, but it is the new reality. Nevertheless, the road to get there is not going to be an easy ride. And that's why uh, today we will ask ourselves the question, uh, what are the hurdles that our customers face in order to uh, achieve their aspirations. And already up front, I can tell you, um, the applications are there. The technology is there, the viable business cases are there, and more importantly, the people are there, the partners are there to start and to not uh, wait any further. This sounds super promising, Noe. Um, but let's get started together and go through this uh, step by step. First of all, we wanted to know where is the starting line, where is the baseline, what is the current situation in the market. And therefore, we asked 150 of our customers how much of their forklift-based processes should be automated in 2025, how much percentage of that one. And the results you see here in the background. So there is the level of automation on the bottom. It's going from zero to 100%. And as we can see, there are some customers who are very ambitious and really want to go for 100% of automation in only five years. This is really impressive. The reasons for that are obvious. You have a 24-7 availability, processes are highly efficient, covered by automation, and it's also a security reason why companies decide for automation. The majority of customers are going for 50% of automation. And even that is impressive, yeah? So we only in five years, half of all the forklift-based trans um, transports or logistics should be covered automatically. Yeah, so to be clear, this is where our customers uh, stated to want to go, yeah? their vision, their aspiration. Now let's have a look at today's situation, the status quo, yeah, which uh, will show a slightly different uh, uh, picture yeah, when we ask the customer which portion of your forklift-based logistics is uh, automated today. And what we see is uh, on the uh, left-hand side, a big, big uh, volume, uh, more than 50% of our customers today still do uh, the majority of their uh, processes or, or, or of their transports in a manual manner. Yeah? That means in order to go to this, let's say, 50% uh, automation in average, there is still a long way to go and uh, quite a bit uh, of uh, hurdles to tackle. So uh, as said, uh, we asked ourselves the question, what is holding you back? Why uh, seems the market to be a little bit reluctant, a little bit uh, careful, and what uh, can we do uh, to take those steps ahead? Yeah, this, exactly, this is what we were really interested in. What are the hurdles from your perspective? And we received all the answers when we did the poll and we could define four main clusters of issues that you are facing when it comes to first automation thoughts. 
The first question which is there is about the processes. Aren't my own processes too complex to cover them by automation? The second topic is regarding the technology. Is the technology available which we need for automation? And is it mature enough? Because I don't want to be the first one who is trying out something new and then in the end it's not reliable. The third aspect which we found us out as a main hurdle is the question of the investment. Isn't it simply too expensive to invest in automation? And even if these three topics are covered, the remaining hurdle seems to be, how can I start? What is the right first step in the direction of automation? And this is what we want to talk with you about today, about these four um, hurdles or issues which you have, which is hindering you from being already in the future, yeah? in the world where you, regarding our poll, want to be. Let's start now with the first hurdle. This was about the processes. Aren't the processes too complex? which you have in your operation. Therefore, we prepared a warehouse for you, and I want to show you some use cases, and I guess that one or the other use case you might exactly know from your operation, because some of them might be similar to what you find in your own warehouses. We start with the first use case, it's the tugger train. We see him there in the upper right corner. This tugger train is on its way to the production to supply the production with pellets. And of course, here in the video, you see the automat automated version of that one. It's not only the truck which is driving automatically, it's also the frames which are equipped with pieces of conveyors so that the goods, the pallets, can be transferred automatically to the production line and even the empty goods can be taken away with a tugger train in the same kind of process. The second use case which we want to look on is in the normal uh, storage which we see over there. There we have a reach truck. A reach truck is quite a common vehicle. Many of you might have it in your own warehouses. And also this can be fully automated already today. As we see in this video, you can store and retrieve pallets in, let's say, standard warehouses. But what is also possible with this kind of truck is to build a block storage. So even on the floor, we can fully automatically build a block storage or even do storing and retrieval in flow-through racking systems. If your warehouse is even higher or you want to build a warehouse which is higher, then we com come to the very, very narrow AL systems. And of course, in our warehouse here, we also have such a system. There we find the VNA truck. You see it here. Also with the VNA truck, it's possible, fully automated, to store and retrieve pallets. These kind of trucks usually don't leave their racking system. They are really big and they stay usually in the racking system. So we have an interface to another transport uh, vehicle, which is taking the pallets over. And also this one can be automated. We also find that one in our warehouse. It's down there. It's a high pallet stacker. And this could, as I just mentioned, for example, take over pallets from the VNA racking system and bring it, for example, to the outbound area. This truck can also store the pallets in one row to prepare it for distribution. Another use case where you could use this uh, kind of vehicle is also for the production supply. So depending on the performance, you could decide either for an automated target train or for an automated um, high lift uh, pallet stacker. So these were four use cases. Now there is a fifth one, and this is the picking process. And since this is your friend, I would like to hand over to you for this process. Yes, so this is the latest generation of uh, picking vehicles. It is a fully autonomous uh, robot, a fully autonomous machine, which supports a manual process. That means, if we have a look, that the picking operator walks along uh, the picking aisles, picks up uh, the needed products, and the vehicle follows uh, uh, to enable the operator to drop uh, the products on the right place. So you eliminate a lot of uh, manual driving, you eliminate a lot of wasted time, and you make the process much more ergonomical uh, for uh, the operator. So I would say, Marina, it is the perfect mix, mix between the human and also the machine. Okay, so five interesting use cases which we just heard of. 
but there is also one topic prerequisites because it looks very smooth, very easy, all these operations which were running, but I can um, tell you and really promise that this is the truth. Also, these customers had to talk with us upfront about some prerequisites and we had to define some uh, rules together how we can operate this um, automated trucks in a perfect way. One of the prerequisites is the load. We need to define which kind of load we have to handle which measurements, which kind of load carrier, is there an overhang? So we really need to be aware of what you want to handle and predefine so that we will not have any disturbances later on in the operation. The second topic is the envi environment in which we want to use these kind of trucks. There is a certain demand for a quality of your floor as well as the air surrounding us, topics like dust, dust could be an issue, the temperature, but also, for example, the storage in installations. We need a certain width in the aisles so that we have enough space to go through with our automated trucks. So all these uh, circumstances and prerequisites need to be fulfilled. Another aspect is, of course, the payback, because for you as a company, it just makes sense to invest in such a system if there is also quite a fast return on invest. And what is helping is if you have a multi-shift operation. In the best case, of course, 24-7, then it's really easy that the system pays back. If you just work in one shift, then it takes a little longer, of course, until um, yeah, the payback is really achieved, which we, you want to have. In addition to the shifts, also the fleet size is decisive or one key success factor to make it really economically attractive to invest in such a system. If you just have a process which is handled by just one vehicle, it's really hard to also have a fast return on invest because you have some fixed costs, some one-time cost, like for example the programming of the controls and the steering of the system. If you have a process which is covered with several trucks because there is such a higher performance which can be covered, these one-time fixed costs can be sp uh, spread over a bigger fleet size and so it's more attractive in the end to you um, and the business case flies more easily. Now having said this about all the prerequisites, we would like to have together with you a deep dive on the technology because this I think is very interesting and uh, Noah will guide us through. Yes, uh, absolutely. So when talking about uh, AGV, Automated Guided Vehicle Technology, I think it's fair to also say that AGVs have been existing already for quite a bit of time. Yeah? So the last years, of course, the interest has been rapidly growing, but already 70s, 80s, the first AGV systems uh, have been commercially uh, implemented. And uh, the systems are usually based on uh, machines that pretty much look like this. Uh, so obviously different suppliers have uh, different uh, uh, aspects, different designs, but in principle uh, the vehicles uh, have similar uh, basic components. Yeah? So what you see is a truck with on top uh, some kind of an automation kit, a control unit, uh, where the laser scanner, the navigation components are built in, but also where the brains of the machine are, the software, the, the computer is in there, uh, which steers uh, the drive wheels, which steers the vehicle to go left, right, uh, front uh, or back. Uh, in, additional, in addition, uh, onto this control box, uh, a lot of sensors, a lot of components are tied uh, to, uh, for instance, also the safety scanners. Yeah? For AGVs, safety is a huge, a big, big, big aspect, which is also why uh, our AGVs are covered with a 360 uh, degree safety field around them, uh, so that whenever an obstacle or whenever a person is detected in the surrounding of the vehicle, the vehicle slows down and the vehicle comes to uh, a halt uh, in order to avoid any risk uh, of a collision. Yeah? On top, of course, there's additional components like user interface. There also is uh, a need for load detection sensors. Yeah, you can imagine uh, if you're lifting a pallet, uh, let's say 10 meters up in the air, uh, before you drop it, you need to make sure that uh, uh, you know the floor is maybe not as good as you have uh, asked up front. 
uh, the pellet is maybe a little bit heavy, so uh, the, the mast is bending slightly. So it means that at the end you need to reposition, you need to recalibrate based on the surroundings uh, that you detect. And these are typically uh, components, modules that are building into the vehicle in order to do uh, this uh, reliable handling. Yeah, so that is kind of the basics of uh, uh, what is built into these types of machines. But in the last year, there has been tremendous amounts uh, of uh, developments, tremendous amounts of uh, R&D topics into which I'd say not only the uh, bigger and the more established AGV companies uh, are uh, investing, are researching, there's also a big amount, hundreds of startups, hundreds of tech and software companies uh, that are shaking up uh, uh, the domains uh, that you see here. And many of them can be quite confusing. Probably a lot of these firms uh, have contradicting statements as well. Uh, so let's pick out a couple of them uh, to see what they are uh, about. Yeah, one that I like a lot and that uh, customers address quite often is the DIY flexibility, do-it-yourself uh, flexibility. Yeah, so um, as uh, uh, environments change quite often, yeah, as uh, uh, requirements uh, for production are, need to be flexible, a customer often have the wish to be capable themselves to modify the layout, to modify where the handover positions are, to change the driving direction, and so on and so on. So this is typically uh, one of the deep domains uh, where a lot of progress, uh, where a lot of uh, development is being made, yeah? uh, which is in quite big contrast with, uh, let's say, uh, how most uh, systems work today yeah, with fixed driving routes where maybe for 10, 15 years uh, vehicles uh, drive uh, on the same paths. Um, maybe tied to uh, the flexibility is the speed of the realization. Yeah? Everyone dreams of a high speed uh, realization where um, uh, the time that engineers spent on site is minimized uh, uh, to an uh, absolute minimum. Yeah? You know that robotics engineers, application engineers, software engineers are uh, people that are often difficult to find. Uh, on top, uh, of course, there is a price tag on it, on uh, playing around on site. And this is something companies tend uh, to minimize, to reduce and optimize as much as possible with the development of new tools, with the development of new softwares uh, to enable really smooth and fast installation. And maybe uh, one of the most important elements also in this installation time would be, uh, for instance, uh, the navigation type. Yeah? And I think... Um, the most hot topic in the field of navigation would be uh, uh, probably SLAM navigation. SLAM navigation stands for simultaneous localization and mapping. Um, uh, it's fair to say, I think that uh, most of the vehicles today work with uh, just standard laser navigation. It means there's a scanner on the top which uh, looks around, uh, uh, looks to different uh, fixed uh, reflector points, measures the distances, measures the angles, and then with uh, Pythagoras, something I think many of you remember from high school somewhere, uh, Pythagoras helps the vehicle to find out uh, its exact position. Yeah? With SLAM navigation, uh, one goes a couple of steps further. Um, so by measuring the surroundings, yeah, and it must not only be the reflector points, it can also be, let's say, the floor, it can be the walls, it can be some, some pillars, the roof, some lamps. So you can use basically all the environment you see to determine uh, where you are at. Yeah? Of course, if you are orienting based on your environment, yeah, you have to know that the environment is also changing. Yeah? It can be that someone puts a pellet in front of the pillar. It can be that uh, 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 pellets are taken away, block sacks are put. So it's a dynamic environment. And with SLAM, yeah, with simultaneous localization and mapping, also these last update, 
updated sensor data is pushed back into the cloud or is transferred back to uh, the uh, traffic manager in order to give the latest information also to the other vehicles to be used uh, as localization means. People are often very confused by all of these technologies and especially what to do with it. Uh, so when people come back from fairs or from seminars, they often come to me and they say, no way, finally I know what I want. I want one pilot AGV. It needs to be autonomous. It needs to uh, avoid obstacles. I must have SLAM, obviously. And uh, I want it uh, to fly to the moon. Yeah? I mean, it gets really uh, ridiculous at some point where we really try uh, to keep our foot on, feet on the ground and to really uh, focus on the business case, focus on the requirements, the application and the loads uh, that are envisaged to be transported in order to have ourselves help you to design the system, help you get the right equipment, get the right uh, software in order to uh, fulfill uh, the job. Uh, so that's a little bit the dilemma uh, that we are facing. And uh, we're living in a little bit in a time where uh, uh, the more sexy uh, something is, the more attention it gets. Uh, however, I think there are innovations, there are uh, developments being performed, which may uh, be even more significant and even more useful for you as a customer that uh, maybe are not as appealing right from the beginning. And I give you just uh, an example. Uh, what you see here are three trucks. They look quite similar. Yeah, you have the uh, high lift uh, pallet stacker. They go two, three meters high. You have a low lift pallet stacker just to do floor transports. And then the third vehicle is uh, for a completely different application is a tractor which uh, uh, drives around as a, as a tucker train, as type of a lean concept uh, where uh, product pallets are moved uh, through uh, production lines. Yeah? And although the applications are very different, you see that all of these machines look very similar. Yeah? And it goes even one step further. Yeah? These machines are built in the same factories with a majority of com components that are similar and where already the standard base trucks can be equipped with a so-called automation interface on which we can plug an automation module. So you see on top of the vehicle there is an arch with the box on the top, and in the box is the brains. In the box uh, you have the controls, the steering, and also all of the navigation components uh, which take over the truck and which steer the truck. As, which is a big advantage, yeah? so the different use cases can be covered with one uh, block, with one module of technology, uh, which is uh, reusable, which is uh, uh, same for all applications. You have the same spare parts, you have the same maintenance, uh, and it also allows us, of course, to make these types of vehicles much more accessible, to produce them in bigger volumes, to get the lead times down and also to start further reducing uh, the production costs. Sounds very good. I mean, on the one hand, uh, this is needed as far as I understand to, in the end, fulfill your expectation, which you um, gave us as a feedback in our poll, that you really want to make the HGV topic big, that you want to uh, substitute 50% of your processes by these pr uh, products. And so we need to be able to produce them in such an amount. And this industrialization of the different products will uh, give us the capacity to deliver what is required in the market in the upcoming years. Yeah. And the other topic which you mentioned is, of course, the investment. And this was the third hurdle which you mentioned. You, as our customers, um, isn't this too expensive? You said now industrialization is one key to bring the cost down, but maybe we can have a deeper look also on the finance aspect. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And uh, of course, we're not going to give you like a final price and a final design system that you can buy today. That's absolutely not the target. But we do experience that a lot of customers struggle to uh, assess uh, what the rough orders of magnitudes are that one is dealing with when planning uh, this type of uh, a system. So 
I just give you some uh, indications when we start with uh, the smallest set of uh, automated vehicles. So I'm not talking about the order pickers. Yeah? I'm talking about the AGVs that drive around without uh, 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 people around 24-7. Uh, yeah? These type of uh, vehicles, depending from whom you buy it, yeah? but I think we know the market quite well, yeah? they are not so far away from each other. Yeah? You're talking about a price range of 60, 65, maybe uh, 70,000 uh, euros uh, for the machine. Yeah, so if you look, for instance, at the pallet uh, stacker, the lift stacker, uh, these machines, each of them does about 12 to 15 transports per hour. So if you were to have, let's say, application 40 pallets uh, movements an hour, you're dealing with three machines, three machines, 65, that's about 200,000 euros. Yeah, plus, of course, the need of integrating everything with the software, with project management, with uh, commissioning and so on. So there you need to add, uh, starting from 100k, 200 and maybe 300 plus for really the bigger and the more uh, complex applications. Yeah, so that shall enable you already for these smaller machines uh, to uh, quite rapidly estimate your return on investments. Of course, we go also some steps higher. We have uh, the class of uh, reach, tr tr reach trucks or similar, uh, which are trucks uh, which uh, go quite a bit higher. They go seven, eight, nine, even 10 meters up in the air with loads of 1,000, 1,500, uh, two tons, two and a half tons, so really heavy loads, uh, which also explains a more sturdy machine and a more costly machine uh, with a price tag around 110 to 150. So a quite big range, also really dependent on the complexity of the application, the lifting height and also the weight, yeah? which is about factor two of uh, the, uh, uh, like double the price of uh, the smaller machines. Mm -hmm. Then we have even one step higher, uh, which uh, is covered by the very narrow aisle trucks, the VNAs. Uh, uh, they go 11, 12, 13, 14 meters, so really uh, high uh, in the air. Uh, I went in one once, uh, and it's really scary. <laughs> uh, but uh, they come also with, uh, obviously, a higher price. So 160, 180, uh, 200,000 euros. So this, this price range. Yeah? So it's about uh, three times the price of the small uh, little uh, machines. Yeah? So that is just to give you a little indication uh, and to help you estimate uh, your business case. And when we do that exercise with our customers, we see that typically they end up with one, one and a half, two, sometimes three, if there's a lot of, let's say, stationary equipment, you go up to four years uh, uh, in return on investments, which generally is, uh, what I believe, a very attractive investment, especially if you know that these types of systems, they last 10, uh, 15 years with, with, with good maintenance. So it's a, it's a good investment. Um, however, uh, fair to say, uh, we still consider a significant amount of money. And Absolutely. Uh, not for all companies, especially in these times, it is uh, possible to immediately uh, put uh, that much cash uh, money on the table, which is why there are also uh, financial solutions to that. There are leasing, operational leasing options, uh, where the struggle in the past has often been uh, to lease the complete package. Yeah? So, of course, there is a long history in leasing the base trucks, the base machines, but on top of the base machines, you have the automation kits, you have the software, you have the resources you need for project implementation, for commissioning, uh, you have maybe some racking on top, some conveyors, uh, you have service to be provided over the years. You have some pre-investment, some pre-finance to be done. So there's a whole a lot of, expert, ex, uh, of, of elements that come with it, yeah, which we can combine into one package and make a, uh, an offer uh, to lease these systems for five, six, even seven years yeah, to avoid that you have on day one uh, to put all of the uh, capital uh, uh, on uh, the table. Yeah, so I think it's fair to say that the business cases are good, 
there is creative ways uh, to make it not hurt too much uh, in terms of uh, uh, investments. Um, but I think there is a third element which is much more difficult to get uh, uh, tangible, which are the non-financial benefits. Mm -hmm. yeah? And um, even in countries where um, labor costs tend to be lower than, for instance, in Germany, uh, more and more companies are highly investing in uh, automation just because of the lack of uh, uh, people, because of the lack of skilled people, and because of the uh, lack of people uh, at the right moment of time, at the right place. Yeah, people not showing up at night, people not showing up at Christmas, in peak season. Yeah, so there is a lot of dependency which can really uh, harm your business and which is uh, quite easily solvable uh, based on uh, automated solutions. Yeah. As said, uh, there's a lot of data being exchanged between the trucks. This data is stored and basically you can track and trace back everything that moved across your warehouse. You can see uh, where the pallet was stored five years ago uh, and see where it was moved. So there's a lot of transparency, there is a lot of diagnostics you can do also to further improve your business and to see what is happening uh, inside your warehouse. Yeah? People safety is, from my point of view, the one that is most difficult to quantify financially. Yeah? You cannot put a price tag on, on safety uh, until something happens. Yeah? And as said, our vehicles are equipped with latest uh, safety technology. Uh, so there uh, we really uh, attach a lot of importance to make sure that the environments where our people work, that they are as safe as uh, possible. And then damage, I think it's an obvious one. Yeah? Uh, uh, we sell uh, and maintenance a lot of manual trucks. Uh, uh, we also live from the fact that uh, they get damaged. Uh, but it's not something you like, it's not something you want. And uh, it's something you can avoid also by having uh, automatic machines yeah, that have zero risk of uh, uh, hitting obstacles, uh, that also have zero risk of damaging the products that were intended for your customers. Yeah? And of course, damaging a product has a cost, but also the fact that you don't, no longer have the product available or the fact that you ship a damaged product to a customer also has an impact on his happiness and has an impact uh, on your long-term uh, relationship. Yeah? Last point is the leanness, the tidiness. It's something you cannot convince someone uh, about before, but all the customers that have systems in place, they are smiling and happy, yeah, peaceful uh, to see that the robots are doing the work for them, that the floor is clean, that the uh, lights are off, and that is everything is sm running smoothly uh, without them uh, needing to uh, take care of it. Yeah? So I think uh, to summarize, many, many uh, advantages uh, apply, uh, even probably a lot more than the ones uh, shown today. But nevertheless, it seems that uh, customers, the market is holding back. So Marina, what do we need to do to get further? Yeah, here we are at our uh, fourth and last hurdle, which we mentioned already right in the beginning. And I think we all know it from our private behavior, private lives. Sometimes we have an intention to do mm. something. We made the decision, we understood all the advantages it has, and we are just not doing now the first step and realize it. And this could also be an issue for companies who want to go for automation. So how to begin, where to start. And uh, first of all, from our perspective, you need to choose the right partner to do this. Because automated projects are also risky. You are really intending to change a lot in your operation. You change the way you work and you don't want to do with this with someone whom you couldn't trust. So you need to choose a partner and this is a very individual choice with whom you can build a perfectly working team. A team which is fighting the way through this jungle which we mentioned in the beginning, uh, built out of a supplier and you as a customer working together. We at Still, we also made our plan how we can guide you through this process, uh, process in the best way from our perspective. And I would like to show you how we created our structure to serve you in this journey um, towards automation. In the beginning, of course, there's your request, your demand. It can be 
defined in a different way. It could be, for example, that you have already a clear process in mind, you know the performance of this process, you know how the handover stations should look like, already quite a clear idea how your automation or the automated plant um, should look like in the end. But it could also be that you just made the decision that you want to go for automation and you do not really have an idea which process is suitable uh, best in your operation for this step. In this case, we would start working with you by sending one of our interlogistics consultants, as we send he uh, see here. Our interlogistic consultant would come to you on site and go together with you through your warehouse, have a look at the processes which you need to cover your operation, and then you can define and choose together which process is really suitable to begin with. Because we would highly not recommend to use the most complex process for your first automation project. It's much easier to firstly go with a more easy process and later enlarge the whole plant, include other functionalities, but first give your company and your employees the chance to get to know such a system and also grow with it. If you decide to work with an interlogistic consultant, you will uh, collect the data about this process together, you will also do the analysis uh, together, um, you, you have the part of delivering the data, the interlogistics consultant uh, is analyzing, and then a rough concept for automation is defined. In the next step, you will work together with one of our sales engineers. This rough concept is transferred to the sales engineer, but you could also, if you have already a clear picture in mind of what you want to do um, as an HEV system, you could also start with our sales engineer. His task is to develop a very detailed automation concept, discuss how the steering will work, really how the handover uh, looks in the different uh, function, uh, function areas, and they will also prepare an offer for you. If you afterwards then decide to work with us to realize the AGV system together with STILL, then your project will be handed over to the operations manager. We see him here. And he is very important for you. Because after this moment of sales, until the start of production, where you are looking uh, forward to, of course, you want to work with the HEV system, there are several weeks, could easily be also months, where we need to implement the product, uh, the, the yeah, products. <laughs> In most cases, it's several AGVs. Uh, implement uh, the, the root course, which has to be followed, do the programming. And there, the operations manager is your contact person. He will be on site. Um, he is also solving issues because this implementation period also always has some challenges. Some adaptions need to be made. Some decisions have to be taken. And uh, this is why this person is so important for you, being dedicated uh, and just focusing on the realization of your project. After then the start of production, the, all the AGVs are running, you have another contact person afterwards, and this is our service, service technician. We as a company with our history and background, of course, have quite a, a broad network on service technician everywhere. And what we do if we sell AGVs, we make sure that also the te service technicians which are close by to your warehouse and your location are especially trained on the automated uh, products which you have then in your operation so that you always reach someone if you have some disturbances or maintenance needs to be done. So in the end, our structure and also our philosophy in partnering in such a project is that we are available for you uh, no matter in which phase of automation you are. If you are just at the beginning and it's just a, a fuzzy thought, we can uh, help you with consulting. But also if you have already a clear picture, we can guide you through the rest of the jungle. And then what is afterwards? After we guided you through, how can it look like afterwards? Maybe it looks like this. <laughs> this shows a little bit the tranquility that uh, Noe was talking about, the calm situation, a relaxed way of working in the warehouses. But now, uh, being serious, uh, of course, we are in intralogistics and uh, we want to also uh, share some impressions of plants which we realized. Um, you see it here. So this is what you get. You get a working system and we can just help you uh, finding the way through the jungle to make it happen. 
Um, and we would be pleased, of course, um, yeah, to be your partner of choice.